I'm delighted to be here today in beautiful San Diego. It's wonderful to see everyone here in this beautiful city. I would like to thank the organizers, number one, for their wonderful work, and number two, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about uh, human factors, and, and the question that I want to leave here with today, hopefully answered, is, is it the next frontier that we need to be looking at? For those of you that don't know me, my name is Felipe, last name Surdoneta, and I um, work at the North Florida, South Georgia VA Hospital and affiliated to the University of Florida. So basically, um, i like to start by saying that I do have something to declare, which is the fact that I have some relationship with some companies, but nothing related to this uh, talk. And for those of you that want to do any further reading afterwards, or they want to fact check me or something, then you can download my references uh, there um, by taking a picture of this QR code. And I will give you a few seconds actually to take a picture of that. So then you can download it at your own time. Now, one of the things is that we um, kind of have a crazy thing that we are interested in, which happens to be uh, airway management. It is something that is what's considered intrinsically risky in the sense that we do basically deal with the worst of the worst. And the other thing to consider is the fact that we are right there at the corner of doing things right or doing things wrong. And, and things can, can get wrong pretty quickly. And when that happens, it's, it's devastating. We all know that. The problem is, as healthcare practitioners, that we like this and highly intelligent and all that, we do have basically the problem of getting into what's called the intelligence trap. And we are basically infatuated by the fact that for the past 40 years, and thankfully so, and a lot of the contribution has come from, the, from this organization, is the fact that we are much better, despite our populations becoming sicker and worse, in a sense, then we do have better results as evidenced by the literature that shows that uh, basically the difficult intubations and the difficult airways have come into a decline. And uh, basically the failed airway is actually also coming into a decline. Um, but we must never forget that we still make critical errors. And when that happens, things go uh, like a, become a kind of, the world becomes on fire. And what is worse about the errors is the fact that some of them and the majority of them are avoidable errors and something that we basically know uh, a pattern and pattern that we get fall into generation by generation and we have not been able to break from that. And that, that's the concern that I have here today. And that's kind of the, the angle that I want to approach. As it was once said, by Henry Ford, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. And what I'm proposing today is that we take a different look and we focus more into human factors. Is it the missing link to actually thinking that we're going to be able to do better? But I'm not talking about human factors as to our performance as humans and all that. I'm talking about the human factor science, which is that the discipline that is basically part psychology, part engineering, and it deals with the, all aspects of our work-related matters, specifically the design or redesign of our, perform, our, of our systems so that we can have better performance, better results, and better well-being, which is obviously the goal that we always have. It basically, it deals with everything that, uh, basically all the interactions that we humans have with other elements of the system in order to improve our performance. It would is what basically prevents us from going from smart being exploding and doing poorly. And it basically touches on the sphere of the intellect, of the knowledge, or, and also of the physical work that we do. And basically um, deals with all issues related to our work. And what's our relationship to our resources and not just to equipment technology, but also human resources to our procedures to our different tasks that we do and to our work environment. If we do not have control of those things, then likelihood is that we are going to perhaps have um, results that are not great. And, and obviously at some point or another, it also dealt with what's called, or at some point or another has been called 
soft skills. And I would like to get rid of that name because I do not like it. There's nothing soft about that. But it also deals with issues about situation awareness, decision making, teamwork, communications, leadership, stress and fatigue management. Things that are very important and they're anything by soft or anything by simple to tackle or deal with. And, and so that's why I do not like the term that I would like to have non-technical skills um, more so than others. But here's the problem. And, and here I, I have to kneel down and, and kind of um, tell you that it, it's actually concerning to the fact that, that, that as human that I cannot get rid of my biases. And here's basically, for example, a map of the different biases that have been the, the latest kind of uh, catalog of biases that, that we can have that can influence my performance during airway management. And don't, don't worry, I counted them for you. There are 180 of them. Um, per, so, so the chances are that I have problems in, intrinsically, um, personally, we all do because we're humans, that are not going to basically allow us to function 100% right. And, and in point, in fact, is the principle of human factors is not the fact that we cannot make mistakes or that we cannot fallible because we are, but is the fact that we cannot change a human condition, but we can change the condition under which humans work. And if you recognize that name, he's the guy that has spoken the most about these things. It would let us thrive into those conditions. It's what makes us basically, if we have a problem, um, that problem does not turn into a devastating consequence. We can able to control or mitigate not only the number of problems that we actually encounter or create, but also their devastating effect becomes less devastating, which is very, very important. And it basically leads us to think not so much into cases or patients, but more as systems. How are we working as a system? And perhaps you guys most of you have excellent systems, but I have also seen the system, systems work. And basically, it is a little bit complex because it doesn't deal just with individuals. It doesn't lead just to technology, workplaces, and processes. It deals with, obviously, the individuals, but also with teams and groups, and also with all aspects of the organizations, all the, basically, all the stakeholders or, or the contributors to our uh, basically our operations and so you perhaps have to include there people that are in administration and making policies or making the acquisitions of devices etc cetera, etc cetera. those people need to be included into the analysis that human factors engineers and professionals do about it now i think it also then has to deal with the fact that we have to become such as other industries that have focus on productivity, on efficiency, on safety, on decreasing errors, and also basically providing savings. We do many things, uh, for example, when we do price shopping and comparisons, the same thing we have to do with our airway management. We want to increase our productivity, we want to increase our efficiency, increase our safety, decrease the number of errors, and also provide the same number of savings. So. Things that come into mind that do this very well, for example, are the Navy SEALs. Is your team basically, is everybody in your team take responsibility for the operations, understands the mission, sets clear priorities, identify and mitigate risk, and have a support network. For me, for example, I view this, the Society, the Society for Airway Management, as my support network. It's basically kind of that knowledge that has come into kind of a puzzle and at different stages and in, in different um, eras of my development has always been the support of the airway management. And, it, and making allies is very important, so that's why I view the other organizations that deal with airway management as well. Let's look in, for example, the SAM projects. Um, for example, accidental extubation, that they have, have, had a, have done a tremendous work, or they've done with the bundles of the physiological difficult airway or COVID-19 or what they're doing now with advanced bronchoscopy, or for example, the plan that actually the airway leads that's actually taken into, and this, or this meeting is a lot dealing with that. It's important to consider that the airway leads needs to also consider that the, those, that leaders should actually be, uh, either have part of the team, somebody is a human act, a factor expert, or hire somebody that's a human factor expert, because if not, the results are not going to be as great. Let's take a look, for example, at accidental extubation. 
they report, and Arthur and Lauren have done a tremendous job about that. They report that annually there's about, what we know, of course, which is the tip of the iceberg, is about 121,000 episodes of accidental intubation per year. Unfortunately, that deals with 33,000 deaths per year, which is enough to fill that Petco um, stadium that we can see here from our windows uh, that does for, for baseball, about 75%. So that's the amount of deaths that actually happen. And it has a tremendous burden in terms of economics. So, so the point being is that they have been telling us this all along, and we are not listening. Something that we do the same mistake 121,000 times, and that's what we know. By the way, I contributed like two patients that I did not tell you about um, accidentally, of course. Um, but that's the point. Uh, human factors deals with those factors and, and, and deals with, with, with such type of problem or deal in, in such a way that we can actually tackle this. Because you guys have been saying it all along, and, and I think the, the humanity has not listened to what, what you guys have to say. And I think that the, the future, the, the next frontier, is we need to be focusing more on our processes. We talk a lot about the sterile cockpit, and is everybody helping you or at least pausing when you're doing your airway procedures? Maybe you do, and, and you're far lucky. That's not my experience. But we need to be planning more on, on, on the planning itself, on, on how to develop partnerships, how to develop, um, improve our sharing of the load when we run into problems, how to improve our communications, those things that are extremely important because they complement our technical capabilities. I would like to see, for example, that we start doing for procedures and in things like <clears throat> our guidelines that we do the task load analysis and for example the NASA task load index that deals with the mental the physical demands the temporal demands of performance um, what's the effort that you require what's the level, level of frustration I think that well, we have kind of a plan but the plan needs to actually be a little more scrutinized what's the role of the different providers it seems that for example the leader takes like three roles at the same time which is inevitable maybe but we could do better if uh, if we could actually assign tasks within the team so that everybody knows what they have to do that that's kind of the, the way human factors would approach it i would like to see more in terms of to decrease adverse events i would like to see more airway vandal bundles um, the design of them and they, they've, that, they've done tremendous work in the icu in the emergency department pediatrics already is coming out with their with their bundle itself and it has to do with uh, basically the design the simulation the interpersonal interprofessional education because we have to remember that we are basically when we call for help we get people with different backgrounds different levels of training and different expertise so it seems that we kind of speak different languages it's not surprising then we have complications occasionally i would like to see better um kind of activity in terms of, of the, the availability and organization and that they're available in a timely manner, our, our airway equipment, which is an, a necessary thing. Um, one minor thing, for example, laryngoscopy. Laryngoscopy continues to take a special deer in a place in our heart because it is kind of a lot of the central aspect of what we do. But we know that direct laryngoscopy is physically demanding, requires a lot of effort, and the reaction time is different when we're doing that, uh, specifically when, when we actually have secondary tasks to do. Well, we now have newer devices, such as the video laryngoscope, that are safer, are more effective, and make us more reliable. Isn't that exactly what basically human factors want to say? And yet when we analyze, they're only available in, in, in minority of cases, uh, the, the highest one, for example, is the LATAM study, which showed that it was used 37%. However, you know, don't, don't be fooled by that because it's the fact that it was at the peak of the COVID era. And as you know, most airway guidelines at that time recommended that uh, video laryngoscope should be used as first choice for the majority of patients. So 37 is actually low, but it's actually very good in, in a sense. So what do I want to say here today, or what would I want to leave you here with today? It's the fact <clears throat> that we need help, we need assistance, and, and we need support from other industries, specifically from human factors experts. Uh, it doesn't, it's not going to come from us, because none of us that I know of are experts in that field. 
Um, and as Henry Ford already said, and I started with a quote of Henry Ford, and I want to finish with one. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that's what I'm going to say. You guys and I, uh, we will get into our, our way of doing things, but we are very tunnel vision, and we need somebody from the outside to show us the way to do it. Um, I'm, I want to leave you with this thought in mind. There's two gentlemen over here, perhaps nobody recognizes them or know who they are. I can tell you who they are. They're Robert Wilson and, and Arno Penzias. And they built it in the, in the 1960s, that uh, antenna that you see on the back, that is the horn antenna, and they made it into in, in New Jersey. The problem is that was the precursor of telecommunications uh, and satellite and telecommunications that obviously today is obsolete. But the whole point is uh, that that was basically the origins of, of such telecommunications which have changed the world. The problem that is after they built it, they actually detected there was a hissing background noise. And, and they thought, okay, we, we messed up the, the design. So they basically then placed it in a different direction, thinking that they were getting noise from, from, the, from the city itself and still happened. Then basically they thought that the hissing noise um, was due to the fact that some pigeons had made nests inside of them. So they rebuilt it and they took care of the pigeons, killed them, of course. And, and still, then the, the noise kept coming. Little did they know that where they were the testing was detecting was the cosmic microwave radiation um, as evidenced by the Big Bang. And that's why they won a Nobel Prize in 1978. The moral of the story is that I have no business speaking about cosmic radiation, something I don't nothing about. But when there's something that has surfaced from generation to generation, and in this particular, particular instance, it happens to be the mistakes that we have made, the repetitive mistakes, evitable, avoidable mistakes that we make, we need to listen, and we're not tapping into something that is telling us there. And I think that evidence is, happens to be human factors. To have a fighting chance, we need to have focus on technology, on education, on our working environment, and our communications, but always have the human factor as the center and as the most important aspect of our operations. When we do that, then we'll, we'll be able to get to the next level. And with that, I thank you for this brief introduction, and I'm looking forward for the rest of the meeting, and I'm delighted to be here in San Diego.